That because of the yeah, lane? Yeah, the old road. You know, construction. <laughs> Not the construction. Like, Such a big difference. Uh, how do I get the... How do I get, how do I get the link, though? I don't know. Man, this is so horrible. Oh, here we go. Okay, uh, Bill, give me give me just one sec. Let me share the link. Yeah. Yeah. I was streaming. Live stream, live stream. So say say hi to everyone. Stream. Okay, so today we have uh, Bill Freeman will give us a talk. I'll let him introduce himself. Uh, the the old snap shirt. I'll I'll let you take over. Uh, okay, hi everybody. I'm uh, Bill Freeman. So real quick, how many of you actually play video games? How many of you play first person shooters? Call of Duty, Counter Strike. Okay, so that's the whole box. <laughs> um, okay, great. So, um, so real quick, quick outline. We'll talk tell you a little bit about who I am. Um, talk about the game that I've been looking at this whole time, Counter Strike. We all understand that. Talk about how I extract data from the replays, or get it data, and then three examples of uh, machine learning to help the game be better. Player impact, um, plus rate smoke grenades, and uh, how the game developers are to make that myself, but it's still a pretty interesting topic. Um, okay, so let's talk about who's this guy. So I'm Bill. Um, so yeah, I got my background is in physics. Undergrad from LSU, got a PhD in physics from the University of California, Riverside. Um, from there, I moved on to uh, Lowe's as a movement over as a data scientist for Chang. Um, and then, uh, so I came there in August 2018, left in February. Uh, then I started a remote company called Royal AI. And then now I'm essentially full time on a startup called PureSkill.gg, which is essentially this whole company. About helping gamers. Uh, so my gaming resume is very impressive. You know, playing games for like 20 years, thousands of hours, a lot of like competitive teams. It's not just you know, oh, I'm gonna sit there and play video games. You know, plan things out, did things in uh, team. Um, you know, I actually won money playing with them. Oh wow! Hey, no. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty good. So yeah, pure skill about GG. It's it's three three person startup. Uh, their co-founders are um, a bunch of people I met in grad school. Um, we just stayed connected by gaming, and then you know, we're making a company together. And so this basically started as uh, after I graduated from my PhD, I was trying to move into data science. And so to do that, the, the a really good idea is to take some kind of project and then use that to talk. The language of data science uh, to, to demonstrate you can do data science stuff. And um, so I decided to look into Counter Strike demos. It's like you, know, you could go and predict the Titanic or you know, fraud detection or the housing prices, but none of those I really care about. So I chose something that I cared about video games. And I would say on the side, I was also, when I actively played this game, I was like, just for fun, helping people get better. They would say, I need help. I don't know what I'm doing wrong. I'm stuck in this rank. My teammates are causing the problem. The enemies are cheating. Everything except themselves. And then I would go and watch and say, you know, oh my god, you're doing so much wrong. <laughs> um, just like you know, missed smokes, inefficient play, you know, bad movement, all these things. Then I noticed that there were just consistent patterns. And so eventually I put two and two together and said, you know, these bad players have patterns of bad mistakes. Things. And then um, also, as I was exploring these Counter Strike replays, there's a lot of data in there. I think you could detect these patterns with machine learning. And so, um,
Phil, can you show a clip of what, what it looks like? Yeah, and that was one of the... Okay, so I showed oh. it on the screen, but yeah, that's... I, I, I was going to ask you, like, we should play a match right now. <laughs> but, <laughs> right now? But I don't ac actually have it installed, so... You're on. Um, yeah, so... <laughs> it's like three gates. So. Okay, so there's a game I've been looking at, Counter-Strike. It's a first-person shooter, five versus five. Uh, everything is round-based. You have one round, you play it out, there'll be a round winner, you move to the next round. When you die during a round, you don't respawn. You have to wait until the next round. So dying is a big deal. If you eliminate the whole team, enemy team, you win the round. There's only five of them, so that's a pretty big impact. Um, Counter-Strike also has an economy. You have to decide to buy weapons at the beginning of this round. Good weapons are expensive, bad weapons are less expensive. Uh, you can save your money for the next round. It carries over. Uh, there's very quick engagement. First to 16 wins. Um, there are two teams, the terrorists, the counter terrorists, T and CT. Uh, you can win by eliminating the other team or through um, an objective. The terrorists try to plant the bomb and explode it. The counter terrorists try to defuse the bomb, get it planted, or let the timer run. Um, so yeah, different kinds of weapons. If you can buy a pistol, you always start with a default very bad pistol. Uh, so you can usually upgrade that. Grenades, flashbangs, blind your enemies. Smoke grenades, block off a section of the map to try to take control of that area with you know, a bomb site in it, then you go to the A bunch of other um, game elements in there. And so there are seven kind of different, different maps, and these things change very, very slowly, which is good if you're trying to do data science. The game is changing very frequently, you write some code, and then the game changed out from under you again. But generally speaking, these things. This should be an animation. Good play. Oh, yeah, nice. Um, okay, so this is gameplay in um, Counter Strike. And so this is a very good player playing. This player is exceptional in a couple of ways. You can see he's moving his crosshair very deliberately. As he turns a corner, he's looking where he anticipates an enemy. And so, like, uh, so here he's anticipating an enemy there, he's there. And then he checked this corner, but there was no one there, so he looked to the next one, but then somebody appeared, so he had to go back and then duel that guy, and then another guy appeared, and then I do want to point out that as this guy engaged the third guy, he backed into this corner, right? So he's protected from the area over there, and then after that threat was gone, he moved into the, the open area to take the other, so he's not putting himself in a two versus one, he put himself in multiple one versus one, to give himself the advantage. So let's look at somebody who is not quite as good. Um, <laughs> and uh, and so you can see right here he's like running into his teammates, um, takes out a grenade and doesn't close it, just kind of stands there, waiting for that grenade to boom. Gage didn't really realize there was an enemy up there, engaged him, but um, instead of backing into a safe corner, he backed into the area of danger uh, where an enemy was hiding and got shot back. Right. So there, there are like a lot of different nuances and patterns that you can sort of start to think about. And There's a lot to this game. It's very complicated. It keeps a lot of people coming. And so here's another clip uh, that sort of shows one bad habit that I want to mention. Is that this player, I'm sure he, he eliminates an opponent, but then he immediately reloaded. You can't shoot while you're reloading. So this guy had, you know, let's say 24 bullets left out of 30. And it was in a one versus one. And so he kills this guy, he goes into cover, reload, but then he peeks out again before he's finished reloading. And then, so, so it's like, you can sort of think about how to detect these kinds of patterns um, through, through machine learning. I think that's specifically one of the easiest to find. You gotta kill, immediately reload it, and then engage it. And then it's not very cool. That's a really common thing that I saw. Well, um, and so CSGO files are in um, uh, CSGO replays. These are game-specific files used to watch the match in the game engine. So they're not super convenient files. There's not really a standard out there. Um, but they're, they're using Google Protobuf to stream their data. Um, it's a pretty old data standard, I assume, because it hasn't changed in 20 years. 
And uh, so essentially what's happening is that in these in this play file, it's a data stream. And so there are two main things, the events happening, weapon fire, player dies, bomb got landed, they spawn, all these things. And then you can also ask it for the state of things. You also have where are people that um, happen. And it was really convenient that Valve, the company that made the game, released the parser, which then the community said, that's nice, we'll make it the same but better. And so there are also a bunch of third party parsers out there, uh, which my slide got messed up, so I'll just move on, but trust me, there's like three of them. And uh, they're all open source, which is super nice. But the parsers provide a framework. They let you listen. You still have to tell it what events to listen to. And so it took uh, a lot of uh, data engineering to sort of figure out which, in, which events are important, what should I be listening for. And so it gives the framework that you really have to go in and say, this is what I want to extract. There's, there's a lot of things going on there. Uh, there's also weird stuff going on in coordinates and data here. And, uh, this event looks like it should go off, but never does. Uh, things that are client side are never relayed in the replay. Um, so certain certain uh, things like which keys a player presses not in the replay. So all I know is your actions in the match. I don't know which keys you're actually pressing. Um, another client. There's Bunch of things, and so um, yeah, no, no text or voice. Also, everything is quantized. Um, Counter Strike is played at 64 ticks per second, it's just a packet of data. You're here, then you're here, then you're here, and the game itself actually interpolates that when you're actually playing it. So it's, it's just like there's, when your data is quantized. Then at the end of the day, it saves half at half the rate, so it's been by two. Annoying things you have to figure out how to do this. And so uh, we've, we've talked about some things that are events like weapon fire, player dying, player responding. There's not that many events, I promise. Um, it's like, why? I lied. Um, there are a lot of events. And so I just sort of you know go through this list and say, like, which are important, which are not. Um, I'm not going to spend all that important time, but. Um, and then when you want the state of things, there are a bunch of data people to figure out how to, how to grab the information that you need. And there's a bunch of misleading labels. It's very annoying. But, uh, oh yes, page two of the, of the state. And, um, but at the end of the day, I you know, spent a few months during that summer uh, between grad school and uh, at Lowe's building out this, this part so I could get some data that I could really sink my teeth nice format. And so our parser outputs 30 separate columns that we call channels, so 30 separate files that we call channels. And a channel can uh, listen to for multiple events or just one event. Um, and so we're pulling out 128 unique columns, essentially 20 million points of data on average per replay. And most of that comes from a player vector, position, velocity, which way they're looking, and anything about the player with time. And so, yeah, saved at 64 ticks per second, bin down to 32 ticks per second, so you get 100 pieces of information per player alive per second. Um, sorry, for every three seconds, sorry, 32 ticks. Um, and, uh, Uh, there's also like the header files that have a ticket. Um, and then we uh, call the meta file, which has information about the actual parser. parser. Um, so, any, any questions about this stuff? Making sense, Jim? So, the, the map is, is does the map. It, oh, ma map wasn't part of the demo, it's just like part of the meta data. So the map, that's actually a good question. The map is nowhere in the demo. But which map is being played is a line in the header. So information about the map is not in the demo. It's just, it just says, here's the file. So it's essentially a pointer to the right file, which is the map. And so if you want map information, you have to go to the map file to extract that, which uh, has been done yet. Which is pretty important for like, can player X see player Y? So like, you can do this. It's a like, spherical coordinate transformation. Just, you're looking at this person, but there could be a wall.
wall in front of you. It doesn't matter. Hmm. Yeah. I was going to kind of piggyback off that. So, one of the examples you mentioned earlier was the case of the guy takes the guy out, gets behind the stairs, goes to where he comes out. Um, so, you don't have the map information that happens to be really important. So, the, the map's changing very slowly. So we, we do have the map information in theory. Okay. Um, we just have to go, it's essentially decompiling the maps, uh, which some people have done, I don't know if you're supposed to, but you can also infer this by taking a whole bunch of these uh, demos and essentially drawing up new coordinates where everybody went. So essentially, the players, players, like they can't go into those stairs, they can only go up to them. Sure. So that amount in data you just have enough data points you can essentially build this, you know, this program. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I just want to show you one example of, of uh, one of these channels, weapon fire. So we have uh, each column is a row in this information table in our documentation, and then the, the column tells you data type it is, whether or not it's null, and our encoding. Um, uh, weapon fire, it's not clear whether or not that would include the names or not, but just look through the data and say, oh, yeah, here's a weapon fire while the weapon was a grenade. So it doesn't include things like that. Would you hold the fire button to do? Uh, more interesting channel would be something like player vector. Um, which we're getting anything that we determine to change quickly with time that any player is doing. So like the position, the velocity, um, and so I should I should mention that pretty much every single one of these has these three time columns, the tick, the round, and the second, which you know the tick, you also know the second, so it's a degenerate column, but it's convenient. Uh, you want to do things by time instead of by tick, surface method. Um, <coughs> yeah, velocity angles. Um, and so we did some work to just make sure that we knew how to transform our coordinates. <laughs> uh, so we just said, you know, I don't know what system Val is using, but we translated it so that it worked exactly like the Wolfram Alpha article on spherical coordinates, so that we can just use. This is these four columns in that same channel, the player vector channel. And so I want to point out that there are uh, four columns related to somebody crouching. So there's two Booleans. One is, are they fully crouched or not? And the other one is, are they in the act of crouching? And the third one is, how fast are they crouching? And then the fourth one is, the absolute amount of their crouching. A floating, floating point value. So with all four of them, it takes four numbers to figure out just exactly how crouched some of them is. Um, so, yeah. um, a couple other columns. Um, so our data kind of looks like this. With the tick, tick is our time, and then each each tick will have information on each player online. This, uh, this is some actual data. Uh, a bot takes their place, but a 
dead player can take over a bot. So you're just listening to that particular event. And then um, you know, item, pick up a little item. One, one pretty annoying thing is that if you notice we have grenade state here, we also have Molotov state. The reason why we had to separate those is because uh, each each event has some uh, data attached to it. So it'd be like, you know, if there's weapon fire for you, what weapon was it, and who shot it? And then we can, you know, take that and merge it with player vector to get where that player was. But grenades, you know, Molotov is a grenade, which is why it's separate. And it turns out that the game developers did not network who threw the Molotov in with that. And so it would be null, you know, who, who done it would be null for every Molotov and if, if they were all together. So we just separated it, and the player ID column is not in there, not in Molotov state, but it is in the state. We decided to just get two separate models and just really emphasize that. It's totally missing. It's not my fault. <laughs> uh, okay, so bet you didn't think we'd be actually doing stuff today. So um, we got a got a data engineering challenge for you, and so very often players will uh, have a key that throws the grenade and jumps at the same time because your velocity gets added to the grenade that goes along from goes to a very specific. So if you push this key, it will do what's called a jump throw. So I'd expect the jump event and the weapon fire event to happen at the same time. So our challenge is, can we actually, how do we actually go through and find where our jump throws? Our data. So I can show you uh, our player action data frame, which is you can see the event type on the far left. Um, it's one of the events that it's listening for is player jump. And so we can find jumps by uh, wherever this player action uh, data frame has uh, the event type is equal to player jump, right? And then weapon fire, I mentioned earlier, also has grenades in it. But we're really we're not looking for jumping while you're shooting weapon. We're jumping while you're shooting grenade. You're throwing a grenade. Um, and so we can also isolate. This um, data frame to get those particular <coughs> weapons. So you can see here the weapon name USB, knife, whatever, decoy, decoy is the name. So you can list the people with the grenades are decoy, smoke, PG grenade, Molotov, incendiary, flashbang. So go through and say, when are those there? Where are these here? And then to actually find this, we just merge them. Do the SQL like so real quick, are most of you using like Python data frames? That's I kind of made that assumption. I didn't realize. And you know a lot of people use other things, but everybody's small. Um what are you merging on time? Yes. Okay, so there the Yes, yeah, uh, so you can just do a, you do a join on time index, so we can either choose a tick for a second. Since tick is an integer, I would probably always do that. Um, and then on player ID, who, who did it and when? And those two mean that it's the exact same person at the exact same time, right? Um, so yeah, tick and player index. And Here's the code that I wrote up to, to do this kind of thing. You can see that, you can't see it at all. Um, so I don't know if other people do this, but these are my row selectors, my index player uh, player action. It just says where is it jump. My index for weapon fire just says wherever weapon name is equal to one of the grenades. Right. And then I added a dummy column in my player action data frame called is jumping just so that when they merge, there's something there to indicate that, uh, that there's a row there that should be merged. And so I'll keep the entire weapon frame data frame, weapon fire data frame, 
and then merge line player action on just tick player ID and then W is the tick um, And so when you do this merge, it'll be on the left merge. So you'll have all of weapon fire. And then you'll merge the player is jumping, and wherever there wasn't a the player jumping, there will be null. This is jumping null. Right? That's the only one that this is the only call that's not in. Round, what, what was if they swap their weapon, picking up somebody's weapon, or they keep the, the one before? So you have to keep looking back. Um, but if they if they have a weapon at the start of the round, they could drop it and then pick it up later and it look just like that. They could buy a different weapon than what they started with, or they could pick up one. Oh, oh, oh. Or a teammate could drop it. Is there a counter? Yeah. That's exactly right. So a player's the items cost money. So if I'm tracking, some, you know, their vector and their status with time, and then suddenly their money changes, they did something to cause that, mm -hmm. and so they purchased a weapon or got an enemy kill or something like that, and so I can just look for when somebody's money changes, and then line that up with pickup events and try and figure things out. Yeah, so there's a just a dot this <coughs> column in pandas, it shows this not super robust code, but I do want to warn that if you remember our data was in, you know, there were multiple time indices because of many different players. So the only, the only solution I have is just like 
loop through every player you just did to, to make sure that you aren't just because player number seven is next to row player number five, there's certainly a difference in the money. You don't want to find that. So onwards to the machine learning. Um, so we're going to do three things today. There's a lot of visual things. I hope this may inspire people to think about that. But um, uh, player impact, uh, looking at smoke grenades and an anti cheat so player impact. Uh, this this came from a common question that players had, or I guess it wasn't a question, but like I get so many enemy eliminations, but my team loses. I lose. Why is this happening? Why? What's what's how you know what? What is my you know, why? And my answer is always, well, you you certainly got a lot of kills, but they weren't anything impactful. They clearly didn't result in more rounds won. They, they were in a situation that was easy to win. So I can think of different situations. So like, if the enemy team has one player left, your team has five, you have complete map control, like it's, it's that player has no teammates to back them up, they can't do anything without them noticing. That round's already won. There's like a 1% chance of that guy killing all five of your teammates to win. But a five versus five is very even. Um, and also, depends on the weapons. Five versus five is even, but if a team is saving their money for the next round, they'll have very, very bad weapons. And the team that you know, maybe won the previous round and still has their good weapons um, has a big advantage there. Even though it's five versus five, the weapons are creating an uh, unequal sort of chance of one team winning that. Does that make sense? And so, so let's, let's, we can sort of formalize this in that our, we can measure impact by essentially predicting the probability that one team will win the round at any point in the round. And then essentially subtracting you know, before you got the kill, after you got the kill. What was that difference? And that's an impact. You can also do this to measure the impact of somebody's death, for instance. They may have gotten a lot of impact with kills, but their deaths were very bad as well. Um, so this breaks down into a very clear supervised learning problem to predict the, the, the winner of the round. And through our data, we have the winners of those rounds. So it's a very clear label supervised learning problem. The trick is engineering features in such a way that, that we can actually do machine learning on this. So we have you know 30 separate CSVs. I don't know any algorithm that can just take those in. We have to engineer this into you know a nice structured data set to, to actually run on this. And so let's think, what, what are the impact, what, what is, uh, if I, based on my game knowledge, what, like basically how would I do this by hand? How would I assign this? What would I look at to assign a percentage by hand? Okay, number of players allowed on the team, their weapons, how much time is left if the bomb is planted, uh, their armor and other equipment, and uh, the map also has a Maps in favor of the team. Um, so it's just a matter of um, extracting that into essentially a data frame that doesn't change width. That, um, I wanted it to, to be a data frame that didn't change based on how many players were along. Um, and so that was sort of tricky. Um, I think I basically went through all of these. Um, so essentially I went through each of these and said, we make some columns. How many players are alive? Pretty easy to extract. Which map is it? Pretty easy to extract. Later on, one hot code that is a string. Um, very very uh, typical uh, data engineering type stuff. Um, what are their weapons? I think was the most challenging thing for a number of reasons. Um, so I, I we'll talk about that on the next slide. But I can also just count how many of them have armor and um, count how many of them have this pretty crucial item on the counter terrorist TPU's kit, cut the time to TPU's the bomb in half. Um, okay, so let's let's think about, about the weapons. So everything else seems easy to encode except for the weapons. Um, and one thing to know is that weapon balance, weapons are not used evenly. 
not even close. And so if I looked at um, I looked at a, some some sample of matches, you can see the AK is very popular, 135,000 kills, whereas M249 has 132. Yeah, so there's three orders of magnitude difference in usage of the weapons. So it seemed like if I had some column or coding for each one, I'm not sure how that would work. I'm not sure that would work well at all. And so I thought to myself, okay, so there are many, many weapons, um, but there are only a few types of weapons. You've got rifle, you've got sniper, you've got SMG, you've got shotgun, and you have heavy. Um, so it seems like I, I could just use that. Right? And so that's, that's basically what I did is I created columns for each of the classes of weapons that I wanted and the number of each team, number of each player on each team that has that kind of weapon. Does that make sense? We'll have a weapon, a column for terrorists with a rifle, a column for a T side with a sniper, T side with a SMG, and so I went through and um, I came up with seven different clusters uh, of these weapons. And um, I did subdivide some of these Strong, strong and weak rifles. Uh, heavy weapons that you should never buy. <laughs> uh, so I put those in their own category. Um, and so, um, yeah, here's a, just a, a snippet of like, uh, you know, figure out which which of these clusters the, the player actually has. And then so I just went through and just you know, literally typed out all these clusters and then said, you know. <coughs> Is it is it uh, strong rifle? Return one. Is it strong weak rifle? Give it two. So this is essentially telling me which column it should go into. My my data frame for my thing is set. Um, yeah. And the other issue that I had was that each round is just a series of. And so, not to dwell on this, but I figured that you know, extracting one bit, one row every five seconds would sort of bias things in ways I'm not certain how. So I just said, you know, per round, per match, give me one instance of time, pick a random moment in time, and go with it. So uh, yeah, I didn't want to include many, many data points in one round. It felt weird. Um, so yeah, so here's my my inputs, my, so now I basically encapsulated the state of the round in all of these columns. And then the thing I'm trying to predict is whether or not the CT is going on. And so, all right, now that, now that we have a nice engineered data set, it's time to pick which, which algorithm should I use. And um, I'm, it, it, you know, a lot of things work on binary classification. Um, I'm curious, has anybody here ever tried auto ML? It, it would work on something like this. Where you just hand in the data set and say, give me whichever algorithm works the best. Right? Um, but I, I sort of wanted some interpretability of this, so I just went with good old logistic regression. <laughs> um, and but frankly, it worked pretty well. Eighty-five um, percent accuracy. This is this is log loss and then my confusion matrix. In any case, um, I can also take a look at uh, take a look at what uh, what my parameters are. See if they make any sense. And so, terrorist winning at zero. Characters winning is one. So I know that the more of each team is alive, that it's more in that favor, right? So counter terrorists being alive, one, terrorists being alive, minus one. So terrorist advantage is negative, counter terrorist advantage is positive. Makes sense. And then again, the armor, that would really help. And uh, so does that make sense? Positive indicates the counter terrorist. Um, so, like my diffuse kit giving counter terrorist advantage makes sense. Um, the number of seconds that have elapsed, 
also gives counterterrorism advantage. The longer and longer you wait, the less time you have to go in and plant the bomb. Um, and so things are making a lot of sense. And I can see. Then I also looked at the weapons and found some weird things. Um, so. <laughs> So the, the rifles, the rifles that most people buy are in these first two columns. So the number of good rifles on terrorists, yeah, negative. Good rifles on counter-terrorists, positive, sure. Um, negative also would be uh, like weak rifles also have the same thing, but they're not as big of an advantage as the strong rifle. The strong rifle's better, weak rifle's not as good, and so that's, that's in the data too. Great. Um, and then SFG, I thought was interesting because says that this is better than a rifle, which it really shouldn't be. Um, and I, I don't really have a good answer for that, other than um, a large, as I said earlier, half of all players are below average. And players at different ranks do a lot of different things, weird things, and um, a lot of players use SMGs as a crutch because they're more forgiving when you're moving while shooting. Their accuracy is a lot higher. So it's a lot of lower level players use those things, which would be interesting. And then, so I'm going to skip the heavies, they don't really help, but the AWP is interesting. The AWP is the biggest, most powerful sniper rifle in counter strike. It's a one shot hit for the, the other team. And so, I saw this, okay, so terrorist buys an AWP, it helps your team out, but a counter terrorist, <coughs> it had a negative parameter. So if you buy the best, Weapon in the game that gives the advantage to the other team. So, so the only thing I can think of is that um, if you buy too many of that weapon, it's a bad idea. If you have every single person has about ten has five sniper rifles, it's not balanced at all. So this is sort of the limitations of logistic regression that you should use as a decision tree. It's something that can handle that you know, one, no, no off. Is okay, one ops is excellent, two ops is alright, three ops is not that great, four ops is bad, and five ops is really bad. So it's uh, your, it goes, like that it's not monotonic, it's five ops is not better than four, it's worse. Um, and so, um, I think I'm running out of time. But yeah, our whole goal was to measure player impact, right? So go before and after. and. Um, so, kind of like I predicted, I'm looking at the kill impact versus frequency here, and I'm noticing a lot of very unimpactful kills. They, they use that kill before they had a 99% chance of winning, after they had a 100. That's the same, that on the scoreboard is the same as before you had a 30% chance, after you had a 50% chance. So, it's, it's, it's really helping players figure out that they're not doing anything. You know, it, it, it's putting context into their kills, which does not ever show up on the scoreboard of almost any game. So you say it's like play, people play basketball, they just like trash time, they just like get the threes and nobody really cares. Exactly, garbage time. Garbage time, garbage, garbage time. time. That's, the, that's the word. Yeah, yeah. so you, you don't count garbage time here. Okay. But it counts on your stats, right? Um, and then also I can look at like an average impact per round and Says, you know, how, how good am I compared to everyone else? Uh, you know, it came out to be pretty normal, except for the people who aren't doing anything. Down there at the bottom, <laughs> have no impact whatsoever on the match. Uh, so it's like, you know, this I can say, if you have this impact or higher, it's above average, this impact or lower, it's below average. It, it, it does depend on like how many engagements you get. So I'm not sure how useful that is. I think for it looks Um, okay, so the next topic is um, smoke grenades. Smoke grenades are used to block off vision on a section of the map. And a lot of times players will line up and throw a very, very precise lined up smoke grenade. When I was helping players out, I would notice they would line up incorrectly and throw the smoke, you know, somewhere there's a gigantic gap in it and threw, threw it off the map, something like that. And so the strategy here that I came up with is okay, so good players are throwing smokes, a lot of times they land always in the exact same spot. 
this seems like a very natural cluster. And so the basic premise here was you threw a smoke and laid it in the cluster. Great job, that probably was what you wanted to do. You threw a smoke, it was close, but not quite within that cluster or just in some radius or something like that. Maybe take another look at that. And then also, if we cluster things correctly, we could possibly figure out, you know, teach players how to work because we know the position and the angle. Um, so, I looked at this a while, this one first thing I looked at. But if we look at the data, so this is a 2D overview of the map, and the red dots are one smoke each, and they're colored at like 2% alpha. So you can really see the density here. And um, so, uh, so, yeah, so you generally see like this area is hotly contested because. We're in a lot of smoke there. This area, this area, this area in particular, is all hotly contested because that's where the burn is. And again, you can really see that players are throwing these smokes in certain areas, but sometimes they're more precise smokes, sometimes they're less precise smokes. Um, so that's, that's something to just, just kind of keep in mind. I think this map really does show up the best is that there are. Very inverse nice smokes, but then there's is this bright dot, this bright dot, and this bright dot. This these two like distinct bright dots. So these players are throwing. You know, they they one player watched YouTube video A, taught them how to throw it like this. The other player watched YouTube video B, taught them to throw it slightly different. Let's say in the two different smokes, they got popularized somehow by two different you know, tutorials. Like and so. When I'm clustering, I need to, I need to think about the properties of this data set. So let's right there. We've got millions of smokes, which is good. Um, we also have a lot of outliers. <laughs> people are people doing things off the map. There are big spikes in density. Some are precise, some are not. I don't know ahead of time how many clusters I really want. But as a player, I can kind of tell. Um, so I, I need to use my game sense, uh, my experience, to sort of figure out what, what I want my, my clusters to look like. And then, of course, the XYZ plot are just straight up in Cartesian or whatever units, but you just sort of think about the density. Uh, you usually set some kind of density threshold. So, yeah, so K means probably not a good idea here. Um, I went with uh, DB scan. I adjusted up to something called HDB scan, which is a hierarchical DB scan. Um, so anyway. So, um, yeah, it's, it's sort of, uh, so with any, any kind of unsupervised learning, I need to set some parameter. In this case, it's going to be cluster size, and then look at it and say, oh, do I like this result or not? Is this, is this really giving me one? Is this useful for players? Is it finding this one that I'm interested in? And um, <coughs> so I can, I can show you what it looks like to uh, change this. And so, right now, this I can tell you that's not useful. Like, those are not real clusters. Um, not real clusters. Like, I think with, with this algorithm changing leaf versus uh, <coughs> default, I don't want to get into the details too much, but there's um, a lot of documentation on how it's doing this. It's like either bottom up, where everything starts in its own cluster, and then you add or starts top down where everything starts with one cluster, and you break them apart. It does give you different results. But at the end of the day, my friend is whichever one is the most useful. Um, so it's, just, it's a lot of trial and error. Really, a lot of at the end of the day, empirical. Which, which one do I think works the best for, for players? Which one? However, I mentioned at the beginning that I'm looking for precisely lined up smokes. So, a big breakthrough came for me when I decided that my data set wasn't just the XYZ coordinate of the smokes, but also of the thrower. And so, that really let me 
throw away a lot of these sort of garbage on the fly smokes that ended up near the others, but not really in the same cluster. And um, so that took a little bit of um, data engineering to be sure that you know, I have degrees with my view angle, so I have XYZ coordinates. Um, at the end of the day, I found that it's not doing anything to either, it still worked fine. So one degree off is similar to one unit difference. It's basically the interpretation that I would have there. Um, a question? Oh. Um, so now it's the same unit. And um, I think maybe the most interesting thing is that I wanted a player crouch and a player uncrouch to be in different clusters. And I want them to be in the same panel, not even close. Um, and so I just made crouch zero and uncrouch like you know, a thousand, a thousand units away from somebody else. There's no way they're going to be in the same cluster. And so just, just made sure that through the engineering that those two kinds of And um, yeah, so at the end of the day, we came up with a lot of these smokes that I, I think are good, um, good players. That you know, they'll show a beginning, the beginning of a smoke and where it landed. Beginning of a smoke and where it landed. Here, here, here. And I think what's, what's really interesting is you can find commonly missed smokes in this method. With this smoke, they threw it and went backwards into no area that's ever contested. This, this, this smoke uh, is somehow commonly just thrown onto the roof of the building here, not blocking anybody ever. Um, you can also find it's Something called a one way here, where this player is actually smoking himself off. But because of the way the game is rendered, it results in a smoke that you can see out of but can't see into. So they call this a one way. The problem with that is that there are very obvious. This player smoking himself off. I know that there's a dude in that smoke, so I just shoot at the smoke even though I can't see it. It just takes a bit of game knowledge to know that there's a thing, a thing such as a one way smoke. It's not a glitch? No. It, okay. It's, it's not considered an exploit or cheat or anything. It's just the way the game is. So, the final thing I mentioned was the meaning cheat. Hopefully, very, very, very excited about this. It's a pretty cool. Uh, I didn't make it, so that's why I got it. So, I want to show another clip of. Somebody who is good. Um, yeah, so yeah, it's pretty good, right? And so the, this this weapon switching from here to there, that's actually a client command that doesn't show up in the, the demo at all. So this is a live stream, um, and so this this guy is, has some key that switches that. It's not an exploit or a cheat or anything, and it clearly gives you a different view of the area. Gun blocks a certain part of your screen, and switching it lets you see that area. Um, and so this is an example of a good player. This is an example of somebody who is not good. Uh, give it a second. Let's see. Is this guy doing? A little bit from this. <laughs> the cheaters hack into your computer. He's hacking the mainframe. Um, okay, so I can tell you that what this player is doing is staring directly at the ground, spinning in a circle, and oh, well, he's looking, staring straight at the ground, spinning in a circle, and moving along. Um, and just moving along the, the ground path, and you're just absolutely not doing anything that a reasonable human could ever do. And and 
so, so essentially, the, you know, the good players are moving left to right. They're across here. It's pretty close to the enemy, and they jerk onto it. The player is staring straight at the ground. So mm -hmm. when they come up, they go pop and shoot right at the head. It's it's like this big ninety degree swing. It's very <laughs> obvious to a person looking. Like you can't even act. You're not even supposed to be able to move if you're spinning in a circle. And somehow this, this sheet figures it out. It, 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 it spoofs the client demands, and the game doesn't double check them. And so, um, <coughs> and so, like as a person, it's very obvious. But you could imagine that uh, you could do some deep learning to try to figure this out. And so, what you do is basically say, um, "Give me." Just before somebody eliminates somebody else, give me all of their angles within the last half second and after for the next quarter second. Give, uh, give me their theta, give me their phi, give me their position, give me their velocity, give me their distance, and just run it through deep learning. And that's what the game developers did. And they called it BackNet. And uh, they've got it running on 600,000 Counter Strike matches every single day. They bought some. 1700 CPUs to run this, and essentially it's something like 95% accurate at finding people with a good map. So it's like a really, really good use of machine learning just help everybody out. Like that's incredibly frustrating to to have somebody on the enemy team tornadoing at you and just you know, ruining the whole match. And the way Counter Strike works is if you abandon the map, you get a penalty. So you're stuck. In the match, there's nothing you can do about it. Um, And then you say, hey, I want to put this on pure skill.gg, and then we will. 
uh, if it's you know, quality, like it, something that people will find useful. Um, and then uh, also, whenever we start charging our customers, part of that will go to whoever is contributing on the work based on these things. So that's if anybody wants to help me contribute. <laughs> so, anyway, thank you very much. Do, do you notice a different play pattern of people from different regions of the world? Uh, so I meant to look into this. There, there generally is um, the thought that different regions have different skills. Um, but they, everybody's, so the ranks are normalized so that the top 1% is in the top, is in the top rank, the next 2% are in the next rank, and so forth. This is basically a normal distribution. And so if you only ever play people in a region, those ranks will have the same distribution, but that doesn't indicate how skilled somebody is. The rank just correlates how good you are relative to everybody else in that region. So, that, so there, there is a strong theory among the uh, the community that certain regions are better or worse, but nobody's actually proven it. So I think there could be. We do have server location information. The, the server name isn't there. Generally, it'd be like U.S. East, U.S. West, Poland. Uh, you know, China East or uh, India, Australia, South Africa. So we can we can find the regions with the server names. Yeah. But I meant actually didn't. How do you get the data to get them? So there there are some sites that uh, that will uh, people can upload their matches to and the sites do stuff, they do some statistics, very interesting, they'll also leave the link there. So the link is a Steam generated link. So the data all came from Steam, but the links themselves may have come from various websites that we can post them. It's all free. What's that? It's all free. What was what free? The data was all free, you didn't buy any data. That's right. I did very painstakingly set my computer to go download it over the course of several months, which did melt my video card, but it was under wow. So, uh, like the heat sink melted. It was wow. apparently only glue gun. <laughs> but, yeah. So, Yeah. <laughs> and maybe we should get a land party here. Land party yeah. office the hour. <laughs> but does that mean over time the players that are going to have access to sophisticated machine learning technology will have an advantage over everybody else? And is that where we will end up at some point? So, so it's it's supposed to be an AI coach, right? So you could easily hire human coaches, which is far better, right, than than any AI could write, and. It's, it's a coach that helps after the fact. It'll lead you to the correct way to do things. It'll lead you to exercises and drills and say what you're doing wrong, but it's still up to the player to actually do that. So it's, it's like having the best coach in the world will give you such an advantage. But hopefully it does give you an advantage. That's our whole business <laughs> model. <laughs> Otherwise, why would anybody buy it? That there's like a lot of frustration at the lower ranks. And they feel stuck. They say something's wrong, the enemy team is cheating, my teammates are mad. I don't know. And then I look at it, this guy threw smoke off the map and you know, blocked his teammate. It's not, it's not good. A lot of movement, movement. <laughs> my personal feeling is like game, the, the gamer world, probably the lower rank people at the time. <laughs> Tox, tox, like you know, like people would like rage on like yeah, playing each other. It probably contributes a lot of depression around the world. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a bad driver raging at everyone else. <laughs> <clears throat> Any other question? Please uh, thank our.
speaker again. Uh, so I don't really have any announcement. We have another social next week, to next Tuesday. Just come grab some whatever drink you want, chat, and then we'll we'll have some more workshops coming. Uh, maybe we do a land party. What do you, what do you think? <laughs> Um, yeah, thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.